Our first scripture lesson comes from Matthew, the 22nd chapter, verses 34 through 40. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Well, friends, we are gathering for the last time this Sunday here on top of Mount Sinai. And you may be saying, thank goodness. Thank goodness Pastor Tracy isn't going to ask us to take off our shoes anymore and we don't have to sing our prayer for illumination anymore and all the extra stuff and these ugly tablets aren't going to be unbeautifying our chancel area. And that is all true. They will all be gone next week. But I don't want you to ever forget that every time we gather, we gather in the presence of God and that makes this holy ground, that makes this a holy place. So for one last time, I invite you to join me in taking off your shoes out of respect and reverence. The word of the Lord comes to us again today from Exodus chapter 20, beginning at verse 1. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. This is the word of the Lord. Well, we've made it to God's number one. This is, yes, thank goodness. This is the first command, not just in numerical order, but also in terms of importance. The most important thing is to give God first place in our lives. God's number one is that God be number one. Jesus talked about the first and greatest commandment this way, as we just heard. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Seek first the kingdom of God, Jesus said, and everything else will fall into place. So what does it mean to make God a priority in our lives? Well, God must be number one for our thanks and praise. We were made to do this. What is the chief end of humanity, the Westminster Confession asks? Say it if you know it. To glorify God and enjoy him forever. We do so because we recognize all that God has done for us. We woke up this morning. We have enough to eat and a safe place to sleep. Those are reasons to praise God. God gave us brains to come up with extraordinary ideas. God gave us hearts that can open with love and compassion. God gave us spirits that can feel God near. God gave us abilities, gifts, and talents to use in this world. If we think we have achieved what we have achieved without God, we're wrong. God has loved us with an everlasting love. God has redeemed us from sin and death. How could we not praise? How could we not say thank you? How can we not worship the God who has been so very generous to all of us? There are 168 hours God gives us every week. It's just one of those too much to spend telling God I love you with our worship 
But this command is not just for Sunday morning worship. We need to praise and thank God daily. We're told in Scripture to praise God from the rising of the sun to its setting. When we start our day, let us praise God for this new day. Before we close our eyes at night, let us notice how God has worked around us, in us, and through us, and say thank you. And when we do this, we're more likely to remember throughout the day that we're not alone and talk to God the entire day. There are great benefits to making God number one in our lives with our praise and worship. Praise lifts our spirits and enables us to um, sense God's presence among us. Praise enlarges our perception of God and reminds us of God's calling on our lives. Giving praise and thanks to God benefits every other relationship in our lives. When authentic praise is a regular practice, we become more transparent more sincere, more loving with our parents and children, our brothers and sisters, our spouses, friends and neighbors, everyone. We become more like Jesus with every praise. So, come weekly to worship with God's people. Don't hold back as Presbyterians are prone to do. Sing with all your heart. Clap your praise. Listen well. Think about what you hear. Open your spirit to God's spirit in love. Let's say it together. I'll start and you repeat. From the rising of the sun to its setting. The, sun to its setting. the name of the Lord is to be praised. One more time, like I do with preschool chapel. From the rising of the sun to its setting. The name of the Lord is to be praised. God must also be number one when we need help. And we will need help. God never promised a life free of hardship or pain. And sometimes we seek help everywhere but God. We try everything and everyone else first. We exhaust all other options before we finally come to God in desperation. But let me ask you, to whom else can we go with so much power and so much love for us? The God we know is unlimited in power and steadfast in love. Ask, and it will be given you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened, Jesus told his disciples. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth, the psalmist confesses. The Lord is my shepherd, David declared. I shall not want. David as brave and as powerful and as rich as he became, never thought twice about calling on God for help. God promises to hear all our cries and act. It may not be exactly what we ask for, but help will come. Grace will come. Strength will come. God promises to walk with us through good and bad, thick and thin, so that even if we lose everything, we have not lost God. In fact, when we have nothing left but God, is when we best learn that God will help us. Football great Jim Kelly needed God's help. His story was reported by Dan Pome in The Athletic this past week. And you might be asking yourselves, why is Pastor Tracy reading The Athletic? Um, fantasy football has created a monster. <laughs> but Jim Kelly reports first, uh, remembering uh, calling on God after crashing through a glass door at six years old. His injuries required 40 stitches. For most of his childhood, he was an altar server at St. Eusebius Roman Catholic Church and later a liturgist. Relying on God was part of his life. 
He needed help again when on the last play of his college career, his throwing shoulder was torn apart by a violent hit, jeopardizing his ability to ever complete another pass. Nearly 4,000 completions and four decades later, the shoulder remains held together with three metal rods. It was miraculous. But as his star rose in the NFL, his faith diminished. He refused to talk about faith with his teammates or with anyone. He lost four Super Bowls and it left a void in him at his retirement. He ended his career with a concussion and was carted off the field. His wife, Jill, was by his side, however, and already parents to a little girl, they welcomed a son. He was the happiest he had ever been until his son was diagnosed with a rare fatal genetic blood disorder. And still, Jim did not go to God for help. In fact, he withdrew even more. He filled his schedule with appearances to avoid the pain and loss and found himself in a dark place. He cheated on Jill. In 2004, after much fasting and prayer, Jill's mother asked Jim to meet her in a parking lot. There she handed him a letter, and as he read it, he wept. Whatever it said, it drove him to confess to his wife and ask forgiveness of her and God. It was then, he says, he felt like the weight of a piano lifted off his back. Jim saw his need for God. In 2018, after multiple cancer diagnoses, squamous cell carcinoma was found in his jaw. It was stage four. The doctors gave Jim a less than 10% chance to beat it because it was so close to his brain. In a 12-hour surgery, his fibula was taken from his leg and used to reconstruct an upper jaw Blood vessels were taken from his arm. False teeth were implanted. The doctor told him, I know you're a Christian and you believe in miracles. That's good because you're going to need one. Jim is not too tough to ask God for help now. At least 12 times a day, Jill swears she hears him say, Lord, help. Asking God for help enlists God's protection, opens doors, and makes a way where there is no way. Asking God for help allows us to see solutions we never saw before. Asking God for help gives us a strength we do not possess in ourselves. You heard exultation. He will raise you up on eagle's wings so that you can soar. Together, us and God, well, we can handle anything. So why not go to God first when we're in need? Again, like preschool chapel, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And finally, God must be number one in our whole life. Calvin wrote that the law has three uses. The first is to hold a mirror up in front of us to allow us to see where we need to improve and drive us to God for help. The second is to restrain evil, making society peaceful and just. The third use of the law is to show us what a life of righteousness looks like as we become more like Christ, as his righteousness is imparted to us, which is what happens when we believe in him. These top 10 commands work out in our lives and they lead to a life of love, peace, joy, health, and abundance, no matter what else is going on in our lives 
or in the world. So as I recommit daily to make God number one in my life, I will strive to love as Christ has loved me, to do unto others as I would have them do unto me, to feed the hungry, visit the sick, and welcome the stranger, to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with God. As I recommit daily to make God number one in my life, well, like number 10 told us, as soon as I want what someone else has, I'll say a prayer of thanksgiving to God for the abundance I do have. I will tell the truth. I will be generous. I will refuse to kill, even with quick-witted words. I will be faithful in all my relationships. As my parents get older, I will make sure they are taken care of. I will say God's name with love and respect. I will get to know God better each and every day and not worship anything unworthy of that worship. All these other commands are rolled up in making God our priority in life. We were made to live this way. We are God's workmanship created for good works in Christ. Repeat after me. We are God's workmanship created for good works in Christ. There are so many advantages to life with God as my priority. Worry and anxiety will have to take a back seat. My control freak tendencies will have to take another day off. My security, which often resides in my finances, must give way to the security found only in God. I can enjoy a life of peace, of love, of great blessing to me and to the world if I will only put God first. If we seek God's kingdom first, everything else will fall into place. So my friends, give your life to God. Make God your priority, the most important relationship in your life. Learn to live God's top 10 commands. Grab God's hand and never let go. It's the number one, the best, the greatest commandment. I know it's hard to get started. I know other things in this world will compete for our time and attention, but there is no more abundant life than one lived with our powerful and loving God. Last week, I had the opportunity to lead our day school chapel, and we just happened to be on the Ten Commandments lesson. The godly play curriculum calls them the ten best ways to live. I already had the handy visual here in the sanctuary I needed for the lesson. But I told these precious children, and I'm telling you as well, that ten is a lot to remember. Right? What about two? Can we remember just two? We can. Love God, love people. Repeat after me. Love God, love people. Love God, love people. That's what the last 10 weeks have been about. That's what God's law has been. From the beginning, forget all the legalism some have made these out to be. Love God and love people. Wouldn't you love to see a world in which the two billion of us that claim the name of Christ actually lived it?